We hope that this annual Caregiver Recognition Day event, even though virtual, will be a wonderful one for you. So um, I wanted to start with a couple of housekeeping details. So first of all, if you could put um, yourselves on mute while this presentation, while the presentation for the day is going on, we will ask you to unmute when you go in your breakout groups. And then if you ask a question in the chat and we call upon you, we'll ask you to unmute then also. But otherwise, if you could keep yourself on mute, that'll be great and it allows everybody to be able to hear the presenters. Um, I also wanted to say that, yes, I saw a couple of people in chat that were asking if they could pick up their goodie bag. Absolutely. The best thing to do is give us a call and tell us we're open from about 930 to 4 at least. Technically, we're open from 9 to 530. But if you can come between 930 and 4 to pick up your goodie bag and call us in advance, we'll have it ready for you in the lobby. And at the same time, we're also giving folks who haven't gotten one a COVID preparedness kit which has it in thermometer, pulse oximeter, antiseptic wipes, hand sanitizer, all that sort of stuff. So anyway, I wanted to um, share that with you and let you know that, that um, you know, you could pick up one of those also, just let us know when you give us a call. So, and if you have any questions, please put them in the chat room. So I'm gonna get started. For those of you that are familiar with Senior Concerns, you know that family caregivers are at the core of our agency and much of the motivation behind what we do. We know that you are the background and the heart of our community, the backbone and the heart of our community. So for that reason, we started an annual Caregiver Recognition Day event, and it's our way to honor and thank you for everything you do each day to support and care for your loved one. Now, in the past, these events were held in person at Las Robles Greens, and we pampered you with a beautiful lunch and ambiance, while also feeding your spirit with our vibrant and meaningful speakers. This year, we wanna keep everybody safe at home. So bear with us as we navigate this new virtual format. You will still be able to ask questions via chat and participate by typing into the chat box and toward the end of the program where you can talk with your fellow caregivers. We hope that you'll still feel pampered by us today for your, and, and with your beautiful goodie bag and with the thoughtful program we put together for you. So this next hour and a half is for you. Our program this year is all about self-care. So you spend so much of your time providing care to someone else, and today we're hoping to show you ways to care for you. I know that you're probably already thinking, I don't have time for that, but we promise you the tips and tricks and ideas that will be shared with you today are not only the things that you can do, but they are things that will reduce your stress and increase your daily joy. And trust me, that is worth every minute and will help you continue your caregiving responsibilities feeling refreshed and focused on the love you're providing. And guess what? You're already doing self-care just by committing to attend this seminar today, this workshop. So here's the self-care wheel um, and it has in six different elements. You have a copy also in your program book, so you can spend some time looking at each section after the program. If you didn't get a program book in your goodie bag, you can also access the program book by going to the Caregiver Recognition Day page on the Senior Concerns website. So today we're going to highlight one aspect of each section of, uh, with our six dynamic speakers. At the end of the speakers, we'll have breakout rooms. Um, at the end of the speakers, we'll have breakout rooms and you can talk in smaller groups with some of your fellow caregivers led by one of our facilitators. So as you listen and participate today, think about what you will take away and use in your daily life. We really wanted to have an opportunity for all of you to be able to talk with one another as we know that's one of the things that you enjoyed most about Caregiver Recognition Day. So before we begin, I'd like to thank the sponsors that have made this program possible especially our two platinum sponsors, Adventist Health, Simi Valley, and Home Helpers in-Home Caregivers, both outstanding organizations doing such great things in our community. I'd also like to thank our gold sponsors, Ama Waterways, who provided you the god gorgeous shawl that's in your goodie bag. Normally every year we have you take out the shawl and give yourself a big hug with it, and we're gonna suggest you do that later on today. 
um, Nefton, Westlake, Volkswagen, and Mazda, who um, hosted our, our goodie bag distribution, and Oakmont Senior Living, and Southern California Edison, and UCLA Health, who provided the goodie bags themselves, along with our amazing speaker on mindfulness. I'd also like to thank our silver, bronze, and friends sponsored listed here. And I'll give you a minute just to look at these great companies because they are sending their love to you by helping to sponsor this program. Okay, so I know you're all busy and we thank you for taking the time to join us today. Now sit back, get comfortable, maybe even nibble on a little bit of the chocolate that's in your goodie bag and enjoy your Caregiver Recognition Day. So let, by, let me start by saying, I'm so glad we have this first speaker on our program. And that was underscored. Most recently, I was reading an AARP magazine article titled, What is Mindfulness and Why Does It Make You Happier? Dr. Marvin Belzer has taught mindfulness meditation for 20 years. He's an adjunct associate professor at the UCLA Department of Psychiatry and Biobehavioral Sciences. You can read more about Dr. Belzer in your program book, but without further ado, and representing the spiritual side of the self-care wheel, Dr. Marvin Belzer. Hi everyone, thank you, Andrea. It's an honor to be here today. And I will share my screen a little bit and I'll also just talk directly with you a little bit. So just to get an idea of um, <clears throat> what we're gonna cover. Uh, this is uh, a brief introduction to the basics of mindfulness for stress management. And uh, 10 minutes is actually enough time. Uh, a joke with my colleagues is that the less time I have, the better I teach. So um, we honestly can cover a lot in these uh, few minutes. Um, this is a photograph of a former student who gave me permission to use this photo. Um, I've had the privilege of teaching meditation in the Sierras on backpacking trips with students. And it is nice to be out there on those great slabs of granite. But the main reason to show this slide is simply to make the point that, yeah, it's nice to be on those great slabs of granite, but mindfulness is definitely something that we can practice no matter where we are, no matter what our circumstances. And, uh, and this has uh, been quite evident over the past 15 months during this pandemic where you know, most people's emotions one way or another have been affected uh, quite dramatically. And mindfulness is one tool that, that can be very helpful. So I will repeat this slide later, but um, this is my email address. I actually give my, up my email freely and I'm happy to be in touch with any of you. And also uh, <clears throat> our center has a, has a website. I'll talk for a couple minutes about what mindfulness is and how we practice it in a meditation. We will do a very brief mindfulness meditation. If for any reason you don't want to do it, that's of course fine. Uh, but the truth is that we don't need to kind of wait until later. And so if you're curious, how do you, well, okay, how do you actually do it? How do you actually do what AARP says is a good thing to do? <clears throat> well, I will teach you uh, briefly. We'll talk again briefly about what we did and how we work, how we use mindfulness with difficult emotions like stress, and then very briefly what our center does. So mindfulness is a capacity that we all have. It's not something that we have to try to create. It's the ability to be aware of what's happening in our experience as it happens. It's perfectly natural capacity, you know, to be able to know what we're hearing, seeing, tasting, smelling, what we're feeling in our bodies, our thoughts, emotions, and so forth. It's also a capacity that we can refine and develop. And this is where meditation comes in. Um, it's one of the most kind of reliable ways <clears throat> to depth develop and refine this capacity. It's also where the science comes in. And uh, at UCLA, there are numerous uh, studies going on. I've taught 
in several of these studies with a six week class, one of them actually for, for caregivers and um, have been surprised. I'm not a scientist, but I've been surprised to hear the results that even a little bit of practice can make a measurable difference. What we do in a meditation, I like to break into two parts. So I'll just spend another 90 seconds describing it and then we'll do a meditation. The first part is we use our ability to focus our attention and we do it in a very simple way. We focus on something happening in our experience that's, that's real. We don't have to make it up or pretend, but we focus on something that's actually not very stimulating. And so it might be ambient sounds, it might be sensations in our bodies, the sensations connected with the breath. Uh, <clears throat> this is very doable. And even this, this idea of focusing attention, if I ask you to look at my hand and if you can see my image on your screen, there's my hand, right? You can focus your attention there <laughs> if you want. I don't know if you want to, but... Uh, you may not be able to see well. So there's all sorts of caveats, but you get the point. It's like this ability to meditate is inherent in normal capacities that we have. And, and we don't have to clear our minds. It's a misconception. We don't have to clear our minds. We don't have to change anything. We can do this even in the midst of a lot of physical pain. And of course, even in the midst of a lot of anxiety, stress, and other emotions. So that's how we get, begin. Most forms of meditation begin in that way, one way or another. And then in mindfulness practice, when our attention drifts, we include whatever has pulled our attention away. And that is just a kind of a recognition, thinking, planning. With emotions, we try to feel them in our bodies. The torso, there often are sensations that are we're not paying attention to because we don't need to so much, but it can be helpful we don't have to kind of squelch the thoughts, but it's good to expand, to include what does this stress feel like right now in me, often in the chest, the, the, the belly, there are sensations, but no big responsibility. Just tune in what is happening and then shift the attention back to the breath. So let's take uh, 90 seconds for this meditation. Um, and I will hope to prove to you, if you want to try, I will hope to prove to you that you can do it. But you do have to try a little bit, but not overdo it. Eyes can be open or closed. Most of us probably find it easier with the eyes closed. Might take a few deeper breaths just to begin, slightly deeper in-breath and out-breath. Then let your breath be normal. And for a few seconds, just notice the sounds you can hear. And please notice how easy this is. We don't have to censor any sounds. We don't have to organize the sounds. We don't have to shut out my voice and hear other things. We don't have to try to hear everything. Just directing attention to this part of our experience, the changing sounds. It's, this is doable. And then when you wish, let your attention settle into your body in much the same way as with sound. Just notice what's there, vibration, pressure, tension, softness. Throughout your body, head, shoulders, arms, hands, torso, legs, feet. And then notice the feel of the breath, the abdomen, chest, or nose probably some sensations for just a few seconds, just letting your attention rest with these sensations by virtue of which you know you're breathing. So I'll ring the bell simply to end the meditation. So thank you, it's good to meditate with you. If your response is, hey, wait a minute, I was just getting started. Listen, that was, I went two minutes, but that's not very long. And yet two minutes can make a difference. It's something you can bring into your life. It's that simple. The more we do it, the more of an effect it has. When, if we have more time, 
then quite naturally for all of us, there would be those moments when we lost track of what we were doing and we started thinking about a problem or something. Uh, and what we do is just include it. It's, it's almost like a permission to, to just be real in these moments because we're not caregiving. We're not going through our to-do list. We're just noticing what's happening for us. And even when it's difficult, such as stress, it can be very helpful just to tune in to what does it feel like right now with that option then of shifting back to the, to the breath. And so that's, that's the core of it. Um, there's a little bit to do this focusing of attention on sounds or our bodies or the breath. And then at this field of permission, just, and, and it can seem both of all of this can seem odd until we start doing it. And then it can be like so sensible and, and, and so forth. So <clears throat> at the uh, mindful awareness research center at UCLA, we do have quite a lot going on for the, uh, the general public, as well as um, our undergrad courses and so forth. Um, there is an app, it's free for everyone called UCLA Mindful with guided meditations. And uh, we're just adding to this on our website with uh, translations into 14 other languages, including ASL. Uh, we do have classes and workshops for the public, including the six week MAPS One class. Uh, these are ongoing and, and, and we're online for a while. Um, <clears throat> there will be some weekend retreats and Saturday retreats. These might seem a little long, it's longer than two minutes, but the truth is I've taught these dozens of times with undergrads when it's the first Saturday or the first weekend of a quarter. It's just like, okay, see you there. So it's perfectly good for beginners and it's been fantastic actually, I feel during this past 15 months, um, we've kind of honed a way of doing these retreats uh, online where people are in their own homes. And then something sort of special, um, in addition to meditation, there's a relational mindfulness where we practice being aware, attending to other people. And uh, Tanzanite M. Sola will be leading uh, some of these. It's, it's not a class really, it's just, well, to be honest, uh, she's a bartender in Brooklyn in addition to being a mindfulness teacher. And uh, a couple of years ago, we were talking and she had this idea of doing mindful happy hour. And so with the undergraduate students, I don't call it mindful happy hour for obvious reasons, but it, that's the spirit of it. And it's, it's really a fantastic, uh, it's cutting edge sort of. So you're all welcome to come to any of these. These are open to the public. Students will be coming for points, but it's great to have a mix of people from all walks of life. So um, once again, my email, I'm happy Andrea to, to have this shared. So don't hesitate to contact me. Uh, I'm actually pretty good at email. And so, um, and I don't have a lot else going on. <laughs> so feel free to write to me if you have any questions. And thank you for your attention today. It's been an honor to, to, to be with you. And I will be, come back for the, the question and answer session. <clears throat> thank you so much, Dr. Belzer. You know, I love the idea of mindful happy hour. There's a few of you that are on this caregiver uh, uh, recognition call here that I know will be having a mindful happy hour soon. But uh, <laughs> thank you. That was really very, um, gosh, I felt myself feeling a little bit more relaxed because those of us, Martha and, and uh, Hannah, that are helping behind the scenes of this virtual event, we're all worried about the technology. And so just to be able to take a, a beautiful breath was great. Thank you. You're welcome. It is surprising how much a difference it can make and, and how accessible it is. And that's at UCLA Mindful Awareness Research Center. This is definitely our, our clear cut mission to make these methods radically accessible and uh, support kind of with the science too, with the science on it also. So I'll circle back for the later part of the, the, the Great, yeah. thank you, thank you. Okay. I am going to wait one second until we get our PowerPoint back up and then we can go from there. So, um, I am the next speaker, so, <laughs> uh, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about values. Um, 
And let me start by saying before my job at Senior Concerns, I used to give seminars in the non-financial side of retirement. So my business was called Rethinking Your Future. And one of the most valuable exercises we did in those seminars was a values exercise. It was truly eye-opening and sometimes future changing for people once they discovered their own personal values. And I've done this with folks that are 50, 60, 70, even 80. So today I'd like to share with you how uncovering our values can lead to happiness. So let's talk a little bit first about what are our values and how do they work? So values are beliefs or ideals that whether we know it or not, guide our decisions and set the tone of how we live our life. So here are some examples of values. If any of you have ever been termed, for instance, an overachiever, achievement might be one of your values, but others might be courage or fairness or faith or family or fun or honesty. I have a friend whose uh, top value is fun, and in the midst of her caregiving experience, she lost all ability to have fun. And it became a hard road for her because that was an important value to her. So what is it that values do? Well, they definitely guide us in how we find direction. So for instance, in our career or in our relationships, and they guide how we make decisions like where we live or our ethical choices. They also help us to know how to act in day-to-day -day situations, what we say, how we treat people, who we're friends with, and so much more. So as you can see, values are really important, but most of us are never taught or able to, uh, you know, have been guided through how to discover our values. So we're going to do a little bit of that today. So where do we get our values from? That's probably a great place to start. So we can get our values from our parents or our family. Um, and I'll give you an example. I remember when I was, I forget, you know, it's funny when you were young and your mom would give you money to go to the corner store to pick up some bread for dinner. And uh, I think to myself now, gosh, you would do that with a young child. But anyway, I went to the store to pick up, I think it's some chopped meat. And uh, on my way back, I found a $20 bill on the roadside. And shy little girl that I am, I told everybody on my way home that I found $20. Next thing I know, there's a knock on our front door and it's the paper boy. And he informed us, my dad was home from work at that time, um, you know, it was five o'clock or so, uh, that he'd lost $20. And I didn't want to give it back. And I, I said to my dad, you know, how do we know if Lenny's telling the truth? And my father said, only the boy and God knew and that I had to trust that he was telling the truth. So acting ethically was an important value my parents instilled in me. Another is your culture. So for instance, my husband grew up in the Irish culture where religion was very important, particularly for him, the Catholic religion. And so my husband was an altar boy as a child and he tells me he even considered the priesthood as a young man, I think until I came along. And then, of course, we share generational values. For example, the silent generation, which pretty much is anybody age 76 or older, were raised during a period of war and economic depression. And they have values around stability and hard work and loyalty. So we can see values come from a lot of places. They're not all from one place. And how do we discover our values? So I want you to try this exercise. If you're interested in understanding your values, this is a great exercise to try for a week. Take a few minutes each day and write down three things. Things that make you feel good. For example, for someone, it might be being creative with painting. Things that make you feel bad. So for me, one of my pet peeves is not being listened to. Gosh, that bothers me. <laughs> and then things that others did that you disliked. I can tell you right now, I can't stand bullies. So, and you'll notice themes that come up. What specific qualities are the root of those themes? And that's one way to begin to understand your values. So for instance, in the first one, what makes you feel good? It might be being creative. 
things that might make you feel bad is to is uh, you know that you want people to value what you're saying. Um, so just to give you an example, the other exercise we included in your goodie bag, and that is a personal values card sort. So you had some eight and a half by eleven um, poster board type um, cards. And our suggestion is that you cut those cards out. And there's also a card that says important to me and not so important to me. So the first thing to do is to sort those cards into one of two piles, things that are important to you and things that are not or less important to you. Now you put to the side the stuff that's less important to you and you work with those other cards. And so what you're going to do then is select your top 10 the top 10 things that are most important to me. And then I'm gonna ask you to whittle it down to five, which is a really hard thing to do. Normally when I do this in a workshop and we're live, people are, are you know, fussing and moaning, it's too hard to do. Um, and then I'm going to ask you to rank them. Number one being the thing that's most important to you all the way to number five. And then what happens with those cards is you now maybe have a little bit of a better understanding about the values that are important to you. So then I'm gonna ask you to define your values a little bit further. So there's a dictionary definition of your values and a personal definition. So let me share with you one of my values, which is empathy. And the dictionary definition of empathy is to understand and share the feelings of others. Now, empathy came to the top for me for a number of reasons. From kindergarten time, I can remember feeling the pain of the kids that were bullied. I remember in, in uh, when I was five years old and I was going home on Mrs. Kelly's kindergarten bus and some bad kid was trying to take a paper that my friend David Greenlaw had drawn. And I got up off my seat and I tried to pull the paper away from the bad boy and give it back to David. And by accident, I tore the paper and I got yelled at. And I remember going home that night and going to bed and I couldn't sleep. And I came downstairs and I said to my dad, my conscience hurts me. And I told him what happened. But it so bothered me, people getting bullied, that I felt like I needed to do something, even at five years old. So I also belong to a book club. And one of the things in book club that um, I often find myself is I'm defending all of the characters in the book, even the bad ones. Well, maybe they were bad because this happened, or did you ever consider such and such? And do you remember reading about so-and-so? Um, and, you know, so it was always about shades of gray with people, never black and white. And then of course, I always try to understand the other person's point of view. It's just what I do. So one of the things you can do is take the journal and the pen that's in your goodie bag. And once you've discovered your top values, you can reflect upon what those top values mean to you. So how can values bring you happiness? You're like, great, Andrea, I've figured out my values, but how do I translate that into happiness? So by tuning into your emotions, you can discover what it is about living that value that that you that you values make you feel good how have values made a positive impact on your life and how has it given you purpose so i'll give you my example again of empathy empathy makes me feel good that i'm a caring person it just does and that oftentimes i try to seek knowledge of things that i don't know so that i can help others that's one of the drivers for me writing my column every other week Empathy was the thing that caused me to adopt our elderly neighbors and care for them. That's Fred and Hilde and Peter and I cared for them for six years. It, you know, when I took a look at their situation and saw that they didn't have anybody to help them, you know, I just felt for them and felt like we needed to do something. And empathy was the thing that sent me on my journey to help others in a much larger way by later on joining Senior Concerns. And by, by the fact that that happened, empathy has really given me purpose in life. So not everything is going to be as nice and neat a story as that, but that one in particular, I think, really helps to demonstrate how uh, living your values helps you to have happiness. So to recap, um, knowing what I'm going to, I'm sorry, I can barely see this, so give me one second here. 
Um, a value set the tone for how we live our lives. And we can still just discover our values at any age. As I mentioned, I did this with a 80 year old church group and they absolutely love the exercise. Um, once you define your values, creating your own personal definition will give you better insight into why it's important to you. And then living our balance, uh, values can bring us three things, balance, fulfillment, and happiness. So I would just end by saying we do have the ability to discover our values and who we truly are. And if we think and behave in alignment with them, we can feel a sense of peace and a feeling that our heart is sending us in the right direction and that we are balanced and happy. Okay. So with that, I am going to um, turn this over to our next presenter. Um, and this is a video recorded pre presentation. And I have to thank um, Dwight Brown of Home Helpers and Home Caregivers. Uh, we were, uh, Dwight was on the planning committee with us. And one of the things we talked about was, well, now that we're doing this virtual, we have an opportunity to bring people in that necessarily might have not been able to be at our live events. And we were thinking about a food segment. And Dwight said he had worked with our presenter before, um, and he contacted her in her Santa Barbara studio, and she was delighted to share some recipes with us. So you can read about Chef Pascal Beal in the program book, as well as go to her website. She hosts a culinary school and she has a gourmet food shop and it's pascalskitchen.com. So representing the physical side of the self-care wheel, Chef Pascal Beal. Hello everyone. My name is Pascal Beal and welcome to my kitchen. I'm here today to talk to you about what I do and hopefully I can share some of my cooking skills with all of you. So I have a cooking school based in Santa Barbara and it's a cooking school that's based on Mediterranean cooking, Mediterranean food, well mostly. As you can probably tell from my accent, I am from England and so little English things creep into my cooking as well. But today we're going to be talking about eating seasonally, eating with the seasons, eating locally, and what I would love to encourage everyone to do, and that's what I talk about in my classes, is to go to the farmer's market and find out what's fresh, what's available, because that's when it's at its best. All the farmers bring their best produce to the farmer's market. It is truly what is in season. And when it's brought to the farmer's market at that time, that's when you get the best flavor, the best tastes, and um, the best prices too. So I thought today I would make a couple of dishes for you and show you one of the techniques I have for making salads. Uh, I've written two books on the subject. I love salads. And I thought I would show you one of my basic simple salads and really using a lot of herbs as well. I love herbs. They impart fantastic flavor to dishes. They're simple and easy to use. They're refreshing. They cleanse your palate. They help digestion. And I use them in everything. And I just think that they add a great touch to the dishes. So I thought I'd make a simple salad. And I'm just going to go through the ingredients with you before I go into the technique. In here, I have some baby gem lettuce, which I got at the farmer's market, and some arugula as well. But everything came from the market and just some crunchy salads. So three and some romaine. These are three different salads that I got at the farmer's market. And I also have here some fresh mint and some fresh cilantro, which I'm going to add to this salad and some little baby cucumbers. So those are all the ingredients. Now, I have here a big salad bowl, well, big-ish. I'm going to make salad for two to three people. I love lots of salads. So I'd be quite happy just eating salads. And what I'm going to do now is make the vinaigrette, the salad dressing. I like to make my salad dressing in the bowl that I'm going to serve the dish in. And for this, we're going to need a little bit of olive oil. I like to use a ratio of three to one. By that, I mean three tablespoons or three teaspoons of olive oil to any one tablespoon of whatever the acid is. And the acid could be lemon juice or it could be vinegar. 
This dinikat is very simple. It is a lemon, lemon juice and olive oil dinikat. Super simple, really fresh and invigorating. One of my favorites. So um, I'm going to pour. I don't need very much because it's not an enormous salad. So I'm just going to measure out three spoons of the olive oil. These are teaspoons into the bowl. And then I'm going to add the juice of half a lemon. And I like to juice lemons with a fork. I think it's the best way. It's, you, you get the most juice out of a lemon this way and you don't need any you funny utensils or anything. You just need a fork. So if you put your fork into the middle of the lemon, basically stab the lemon in the middle, and then you're going to hold the fork by the tines right here, and you're going to squeeze the lemon and turn the lemon away from you and turn the fork towards you. So it's sort of this motion. And when you do that, you get more juice out of the lemon than anything else. It's so easy. Also, to help you get juice out of a lemon, you can roll the lemon on a countertop beforehand, and that will help soften the membranes and it will get lots of juice out of the lemon. So now I'm just going to whisk this together slowly, like so, until it forms an emulsion. You want it to all come together and you'll see it come together and it forms this lovely emulsion. And then to this, I'm going to add some salt and pepper. But I quite like things with lots of pepper. So I've got four or five grams of pepper and a pinch of salt, not too much salt. You can always add salt, but you can't take it out. So I think it's better to not put too much. If individuals want more salt, then they can add it. Then this is the trick with all my salads. This is what I do with everyone. I take salad utensils and I put them over the vinaigrette. Now you can rest your salad greens on top of the utensils and they don't get all soggy. Have you ever had a salad when the salad greens are really soggy and they just wilted because they're drenched in the vinaigrette? It's not very nice. So this is my trick. This is what I do. Um, I, now I can rest all the salad greens on top of here, like so. I'll just put those there. And then I'm going to add lots of fresh herbs to this. So lots of mint and the cilantro. I like big bites of it, so I haven't really chopped it up. If you want it to be um, fine, you can absolutely do that. So the mint and the cilantro are in here. And then to this, I'm just going to add a little bit of cucumber. So I've got these little Persian cucumbers that I found. And I'm just going to slice them in thin, thin slices. It's always good to have a sharp knife to do this. And then scatter those over the top. There. I think that's enough. So I'm going to put these over the top. So now we've got this mint and cilantro and salad, which is delicious. And when I'm ready to serve it, all you need, to, all I need to do, or all you'll need to do, is take the utensils out, the salad falls into the vinaigrette, and then you can toss it, which I'll do in just a minute. I'm going to show you the other dish. So I have two dishes for you today. So that's the green salad inspired by what I found at the farmer's market. And you know, we're in the mid we're heading into summer. It's a fantastic time. We are in the middle of stone fruit season. Delicious, you have fresh peaches and apricots and nectarines and plums and pluots and all of these gorgeous stone fruit that are coming into season now. We're sort of heading into the end of cherry season. And also at the market, we have green beans. And if you're lucky enough to find a farmer who grows them, the little thin French green beans called haricots verts. And these, this is the other standard I'm going to show you. I love haricots verts. I grew up with it. So I'm, you may guess from my accent, I'm half French and half English. And the French side of me, absolutely adores. And this is a classic French dish. My grandmother taught me to make it. So let's do that. I'm just going to move this out of the way. I have made a twist, a twist on the salad. So these are, well, in theory, they were, they were billed as haricots verts. I think they're a little bit big um, for haricots verts. So it's basically a thin or baby green bean. 
And I cook these in, I get a shallow pan and I fill it with boiling water and then I cook them for four or five minutes. Just, you want them to be al dente, like pasta. You want them to still have a little bite to them. You know, don't want them to be soft and all floppy. Um, and then as soon as I cooked, I take them out and I put them in a colander and I ran cold water over them so that they stopped the cooking. And then I dried them. So now we have my plate of green beans and that's the start. At the farmer's market, I also found these. Look, aren't these gorgeous? So baby, just these beautiful asparagus with these slightly purple tips. I adore these. And these are amazing raw. So I quite like having salads where you have something, an element that is cooked and an element that is raw. You get a nice change in texture and asparagus raw is fantastic. Just make sure you rinse it. So these have been cleaned. And what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to trim the tips off because the tips look so pretty, like so. And I'm going to add the tips to the top of the salad. And then the rest of the stems, I will just chop finely. So here's this salad. And I will just add these. And it's this is really easy to make. Right, you've cooked your green beans and you've added some raw chopped asparagus. Now, obviously, these are organic asparagus and they are fresh from the farmer's market. I just got them a couple of days ago and they're just fantastic, even raw. I once walked through a garden of a friend of mine and she grows amazing vegetables. And she said, here, do you want to try this? And she reached down and she just plucked an asparagus spear out of the ground and said, here, try it. And I munched away on this salad and I thought, oh my God, this is so fantastic. And the flavor is so delicious. So since then, I've incorporated lots of raw asparagus into salads and it's terrific. So I'm just going to chop these. Um, I'm just going to add a little bit more of the stems and I'll sprinkle these over the top there. All right, now to this, I'm going to make a mustard vinaigrette. I love mustard, good mustard. So this uses a Dijon mustard. Use the mustard, use the mustard that you like the best. I personally like Dijon mustard and this one, this one is called Edmond Fallot. Edmond, it's French, it's a French name. Edmond Fallot, F-A-L-L-O-T. And this particular mustard is called, it's a walnut Dijon mustard, so it's a nut mustard. If you don't have to have this, you can use a Dijon mustard or use whatever your favorite mustard is. But we're going to make a mustard vinaigrette to put over the top of this. So, but that's what I'm using here. So I've got that and somewhere, yes, I have a bowl. So I'm going to put a little bit, about a teaspoonful of mustard in the bottom of the bowl. And to this, I'm going to add my three teaspoons of the olive oil. This is a basil olive oil. Again, you can use whichever olive oil you like, your favorite oil. And then one teaspoon, once I've mixed this together. Nearly there. Now I'm going to add one teaspoon of the vinegar. And I used a champagne vinegar. Again, you can use whatever vinegar you like, but I wouldn't use a balsamic because a balsamic would be too strong and that will take away from the flavor of the vegetables, which are delicious and you don't want to lose that flavor. So I'm mixing all of this together so that it forms an emulsion. And then into this here, I have, this is one small shallot. If you like garlic, you could put garlic into it, but I. I found that that's a bit overpowering for the salad. So I've put a shallot into this and you can see how this has all come together nicely. And then I am going to spoon this over the salad. I've got my gorgeous greens here. And this now just gets poured all over the top. Now, if you have some poached chicken, or grilled chicken, or grilled salmon, or grilled shrimp. Any of those proteins would go really, really well with this. You can add that to the salad, 
Or even some steamed potatoes would be good. You could make a type of salade niçoise with it. You could have some salmon and some little potatoes or even add some cherry tomatoes. So lots and lots of variations. At the farmer's market in the coming weeks, there are going to be so many little tiny tomatoes that are just gorgeous and delicious. And those will be a fantastic addition to this salad. So that's what this looks like right now. Finishing touch, a little bit of pepper and a smidgen of salt. This is a salad that you can dress a little bit ahead of time. It won't suffer from having the salad, the vinaigrette, the salad dressing on top of it. It will be fine just the way it is. So that haricot vert, a thin green bean salad with raw asparagus and the mustard vinaigrette. Super easy to make, super quick and easy to make. And that's what this is all about. Just eat with the seasons and eat with nature at its best and you will reap the benefits. Um, I will show you the tossing of the other salad so that you can see what that looks like. Right, remember the vinaigrette's in the bottom of the bowl. So now I take my utensils out and now I can toss this with the vinaigrette that's already in the bowl and dinner is served. If you wanted, actually, when I think about it, if you wanted to add this, if you wanted to have any grilled vegetables or grilled meat or roast chicken with this would be fantastic. So there we go. I wish I could have you smell it because I can smell the aroma of all the mint and the herbs in here. And it just smells really, really refreshing. So voila, that's my class. And I hope you enjoy the dishes. I hope you try some of these techniques. And if you want more information and more recipes, do have a look at my website. There are tons and tons of recipes on there. My recipe, uh, my recipes. My website is pascalskitchen.com. And I hope you've enjoyed this little class. And I have to say is bon appétit. Bye everyone. Oh my gosh, is Pascal amazing or what? Um, I wanna tell you that I made her haricot vert uh, recipe about a week ago. And of course I couldn't find the walnut mustard and I couldn't find basil olive oil. So I improvised a little. So let me tell you what I did. I took my regular gray poupon uh, um, Dijon mustard and the oil and the vinaigrette um, and the uh, vinegar that she suggested and then I added a bit of fresh pesto to the dressing. I mean, I, I bought it at Gelson's, but it was, uh, you know, in the refrigerated section. And it tasted, I thought, well, okay, the, the pine nuts will substitute for the walnuts and the basil will substitute for the basil olive oil. And it was delicious. So um, I would recommend it highly. Um, and you know, the other, I, I have a number of Pascal's cookbooks. I'll tell you a funny story in a moment. But uh, when I go to bring a salad to a potluck, that is exactly the way how I bring my salad. I make the vinaigrette in the bowl. I put the serving utensils, then I put the salad on. And if somebody has room in their refrigerator, once I get it to their house, they put it in the refrigerator and then it's good to go, uh, you know, when, uh, when we're ready to eat. So it's a great, great suggestion. Uh, lastly, I'll just say that I mentioned I have a number of Pascal's cookbooks and um, she's written two cookbooks on salad, Salad One and Salad Two. And Salad One is out of print now, but um, many moons ago when Let's Get Cooking was open, I went ahead and bought a few of them with her signature, her autograph, because I guess she must have done a cooking class at Let's Get Cooking and um, gave one to my friend Kalila Heller, who's on the, on the uh, Zoom today. And it's so funny, when Dwight was mentioning Pascal, Kalila said, Andrea, that's the cookbook you gave me. So just shows you what a small world it is. So again, thank you, Chef Pascal. Okay, our next presenter is going to talk about a common challenge many of us face, uh, which is setting and holding boundaries. Jenica Polakow is a licensed clinical social worker specializing in older adults. You can read more about her and her amazing background in the program book, but I also wanted to let you know that the, we are thrilled she has recently joined the Board of Senior Concerns. Representing the professional side of the self-care wheel, Jenica Polakow. 
Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. And yes, setting and holding boundaries can be a challenge for many of us, but especially for family caregivers. It can be difficult to even identify what you want and need, let alone ask for it. So what I would like to talk with you about today is figuring out your healthy boundaries and also how to implement them. So first, let's define boundaries. Google defines a boundary as a line that marks the limits of an area, a dividing line. So we can think of personal boundaries as the limits and rules we set for ourselves within relationships. You might have unhealthy boundaries if you share too much too soon, or if you close yourself off and don't express your needs and wants. You might have unhealthy boundaries if you feel responsible for others' happiness, if you have a hard time saying no for fear of rejection or abandonment, if you fear what others think of you. You might have unhealthy boundaries also if you agree when you actually feel like disagreeing. Poor boundaries often lead to resentment, anger, and burnout. Ne neglecting yourself in order to take care of somebody else might seem like an action of love, but giving from a place of emptiness only leads to resentment towards the other person and eventually towards yourself. So what are healthy boundaries? Common traits of healthy boundaries look like someone who values their own opinions, shares personal information in an appropriate way, not over or under sharing, and knows their own wants and needs and can communicate them. Healthy boundaries are a crucial component of self-care. Some advantages of healthy boundaries are improved mental health, a well-formed sense of identity and autonomy, and avoidance of burnout. I've always liked the idea of thinking of my own boundaries as my house and the rooms, doors, and windows where I let different people in or out. In my life and in my house, some people are only gonna be allowed to get to the front door. So when the Amazon delivery person or pizza delivery person comes, they may or may not ring the bell or knock, but it's my choice to open the door or not. For other people, such as neighbors or friends, I will likely invite them into the entry of my house, into my family room, or maybe into my kitchen. However, some people are never going to be coming upstairs or into my bedroom or my personal bathroom. I keep those doors closed to most people outside of my closest family and friends. Those are boundaries I created to feel safe in my own home. With these healthy personal boundaries, I decide who to let in and out of those emotional spaces. Of course, I can change whom I let into the various rooms in my house and when. The first step to set boundaries is self-awareness. Pay attention to the situations when you are low on energy, feel butterflies in your stomach, or wanna cry. Identifying where you need more space, self-respect, energy, or personal power is the first step. One way to think of this might be to set your non-negotiables. So I'd like to do a short exercise to help you identify your boundaries. So please silently complete the following sentences with an example of your own. Number one, people may not, and then you fill in the blank. So. A couple examples would be, people may not humiliate me in front of others. People may not criticize me. People may not go through my personal things. Number two, I have the right to ask for, fill in the blank. Some examples, I have the right to ask for privacy. I have the right to ask for more information about a new medication. I have the right for support. I have the right to ask for support. And number three, to protect my time and energy, it is okay to fill in the blank. To protect my time and energy, it is okay to change my mind. To protect my time and energy, it is okay to turn the ringer off on my phone. To protect my time and energy, it is okay to say no. So now hopefully we understand a little bit more about what healthy boundaries are and why they're necessary. But what happens when we start implementing them? Here are a few tips for putting healthy boundaries into practice. When you identify the need to set a boundary, 
do it clearly, calmly, firmly, and in as few words as possible. You don't need to justify, get angry, or apologize for the boundary you are setting. You are not responsible for the other person's reaction to your boundary. You are only responsible for communicating your boundary in a respectful manner. If it upsets the other person, please let them know that that is their problem. Some people, especially those accustomed to controlling or manipulating you, might test you. Saying no may seem like a harsh statement, especially to a caregiver who prides himself on being helpful, kind, and loving. In fact, most caregivers at first feel selfish, guilty, or even embarrassed about setting a boundary. Do it anyway, and remind yourself you have a right to self-care. Don't let anxiety or fear prevent you from taking care of yourself. When you feel anger or resentment, it's likely a sign that you need to set a boundary. Listen to yourself, determine what needs to be said, and then communicate assertively. Learning to set healthy boundaries takes time and practice. It is a process. No doesn't necessarily have to have a negative connotation attached to its meaning. A no can be empowering and mean, I'm tired and don't feel capable of doing this task. A no can mean, I need a break for rest and reflection. A no can also mean, it's time for things to change. A person with healthy boundaries can say no to others when they want to, but they are also comfortable saying yes to offers of help when needed. Remember, self-care is hardest to do when you need it the most. I'd like to wrap up with a quote from writer and activist Prentice Hemphill. Boundaries are the distance at which I can love you and me simultaneously. Thank you. Oh my gosh. Jenica, that was amazing. I'm gonna repeat the three questions that you had people ask themselves because I think they're so important. I actually think I'm gonna put them on my a post-it note on my computer. <laughs> people may not fill in the blank. I have the right to ask for fill in the blank and um, to protect my time and energy. It is okay to fill in the blank. You got it. Where were you when I was younger? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, okay. Um, so I want to next, uh, we're going to turn the corner a little bit here. So for those of you that have ever been to our in-person Caregiver Recognition Day, you know our comedian is one of the main highlights of our program. And again, due to the virtual nature of our programming, we can bring a comedian whose television credits include NBC, CBS, ABC, Lifetime, and Comedy Central. Representing the emotional side of the self-care wheel, Francis DiLorenzo. This, uh, this event. I've been doing some really fun events. I, I Coincidentally, I did a similar event about a week ago. I was performing in a hospital, and as soon as I got done, I said to the people, I hope you all get better, and they looked at me and said, you too. <laughs> Amazing though, I've had all kinds of crazy events. Uh, as a matter of fact, earlier this year, I get a call to do an event in Omaha, and I said, I would love to. I said, how did you guys find me? And they said, well, Warren Buffett's daughter found you online and demanded we hired you. And I flipped out, I'm like, no way, Warren Buffett's daughter? I'm like, oh my gosh, tell her to tell him I love his music. <laughs> Like the richest guy on the planet, right? And I was like, oh my 
God, this will be exciting, right? But I thought I'll never meet him. But two days before I'm supposed to fly out there, I get an email that says Warren Buffett would like to take you to dinner. I know. And I was like, wrote back and I was like, I'd love to, but just let him know I do not put out on the first date. <laughs> so this is all true. It's all true. It turned out my flight didn't get in on time, so he said, send the jet for her. <laughs> I know, and that's when I realized, wow, we really think alike. Um, <laughs> can't get any better. Well, then Susie, his daughter, says, why don't you just spend the night at my house? I spent the night at her house. It was spectacular. I couldn't believe it, but I felt so bad. Like, when I got home, I realized out of habit, I had stolen her towels. Uh, <laughs> I got some really high-end, you know, hair care products. Uh, full size, too. It was awesome. It's a really nice water for crystal. That was great. That was great. So I meet up with Warren, and we have dinner, and we hit it off like you wouldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. I had a blast and a half. And then before you knew it, he invited me to the office. He goes, why don't you go to the office tomorrow? So the next day, I'm at Berkshire Hathaway, and I was like, wow, this is amazing. But then it hit me. I'm like, technically, this is the second date. So... Viagra now, I'll be back in three and a half hours. <laughs> of course, the next morning, my husband calls me to see how it went, you know, and I was pissed, you know. I was, because I was like, Warren is still sleeping! <laughs> we had so much fun. We had so much fun. And he, he just turned 85, like last week. He's 85 years old. Oh my gosh. I think he likes being around me because I make him feel 79 again. <laughs> and he's so, oh my God, he's so wealthy, but he's so down to earth. He's not showy. He's not spendy, which sucks. <laughs> and from there, um, I don't know. I've been doing all kinds of stuff. Um, um, I, I, I thought to myself, 85 years old, I flirt with them, I play with them, but I'm just joking, of course, because that's not my style. As a matter of fact, a lot of women my age are actually dumping, dumping their husbands and then going for younger guys, right? The cougars, right? Yeah, I know. That is so not for me either, because why would I want to date someone with 20-20 vision? <laughs> years. I've been married over 20 years and I love my man. I do. And we are so different though too. And whenever I tell people that, they try to make me feel better. They say, well, you know, opposites attract. And I guess it's true because like he's an introvert. I'm an extrovert. He's a vegetarian. I'm a lesbian. <laughs> Don't worry, if you're in this room, you're okay. <laughs> you don't have to be tight. Um. I didn't like 
I be me, that wasn't my goal, you know what I mean? And, and I didn't like slouch either. Like, as a matter of fact, one time I was at a bank and some guy's in front of me, he was like five nothing, right? And I wanted to give him a compliment, so I looked right at him, I'm like, you are so cute! <laughs> yes, you are! Oh, yes, you are! <laughs> he got upset, he did, so I, I looked at him, I'm like, don't be mad, you know, I picked him up, I'm like, oh, come on, let's just... <laughs> He got all upset, so I had to put him down. He just scurried away. I felt like saying, fine, go deposit your pot of gold, you I never liked slouching as a tall woman, though. I didn't. I, I always wanted to carry myself nice and tall. But I did do that, uh, that, that hip stand thing. Are you look pretty tall? How tall are you? Five ten? Five nine? Yeah, you're like, did you do the hip thing to shrink a little bit? Look at like five ten, like, look at five seven. Did you ever do that? No? I was, it worked out pretty good until there was this short guy across the way, and oh my god, he was cute. He started walking towards me, and I was like, oh my god, he's a little shorter than I thought. Oh, oh, really? Oh my god. gracious. Frances, she's a little irreverent, but she's pretty funny. <laughs> oh, goodness. Um, so I am going to turn this over right now to Martha Shapiro, who's going to introduce our opportunity to chat with one another as, as uh, family caregivers. So Martha. All right. Thank you, everybody. That was funny. And just the, the image of her upside down on the chair talking on the phone reminded me a little too much of my daughter, who's starting to enter those those phone years, my goodness, so that is my life. Um, but yes, yeah, sometimes we have to just give ourselves permission to laugh and laugh at the funny that happens to us every day, as I'm sure you all know. So hopefully you enjoyed that. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Martha Shapiro, the Director of Programs here at Senior Concerns. And when we've had these events in the past, I think one of the best aspects is that you get to meet each other and see the caregiver community that you're all a part of. You know, everybody that's joining us today, you all have something incredible in common with each other. And so normally you'd get to chat while you're heading to the bathroom or getting your cup of coffee or having your lunch together. So we wanted to find a way, even though we're virtual this year, to still let you connect and get to know each other a little bit. So this next part, we're going to use all the wonderful features of Zoom and do breakout rooms where you will be put into a smaller group so that you can chat together 
Um, and each group has a facilitator. So somebody that either works for Senior Concerns or is one of our community partners who will help to lead the discussion. We have some discussion questions to get you all going, but of course this is really open to anything that you wanna share and talk about today. Um, just to note, while we are recording our speakers today, the breakout rooms will not be recorded, so you can feel comfortable to share with each other. That is the time that you should unmute yourself and turn on your camera if you're comfortable doing so, so that you can all share and chat with each other a little bit. So we will give you just about 10 minutes in your group, and what will happen is I will press a magic button and you'll get a little alert that tells you that you're going to go into a breakout room. And if you don't press anything, you'll automatically be taken there. And then at the end of the time, you'll get a one minute countdown so you can all wrap up your discussion and then you'll just naturally be brought back in. So you don't have to do anything on your end. Um, and then we will wrap up our fabulous day today. So here we go. Fingers crossed that technology is on our side and enjoy your discussion. And um, so Carrie, she is our social worker. She's an LCSW and she runs our Caregiver Resource Center. Carrie, do you want to introduce yourself? You're still muted though. <laughs> There we go. Hi, yes, like Martha said, I am a licensed clinical social worker. I'm the um, case manager of the Family Caregiver Resource Center at Senior Concerns, and I am happy to help you along your caregiving journey, journey no matter where you are in that journey, at the beginning, in the middle, um, towards the end. Happy to be here. I am a good support system for you. Um, I am your new best friend. And I am available for care consultations that are free and also um, caregiving support groups, one every Friday for family caregivers of any kind. And I am also uh, do facilitate a group for adult children um, twice a month on Thursdays via Zoom right now. Wonderful, thank you, Carrie. Wonderful. And Hannah is our wonderful senior advocate slash um, adult day program lead as we start to reopen. She will get to be moving over and running um, our adult day program. So Hannah, you wanna introduce yourself or I might've just said everything. Well, hi, I'm, I'm Hannah. I'm a social worker um, and I lead a support group every other Wednesday or first and third uh, Wednesday of the month. We do it on Zoom. Uh, and then, yeah, I'm here to answer any questions. And if I can't answer your questions, I'll either ask Carrie, Martha, or do a little bit of research. I'll help you figure it out. So thank you so much. And uh, I look forward to speaking with everybody. Well, thank you. And I haven't seen any specific questions coming in the chat. Just some wonderful thank yous for the presentation and the day. Um, and we really can't wait to be back in person with you all next year. Uh, but I will go ahead and turn it back over to Andrea. Um, I see that Marvin has put his email into the chat. So I think that's incredibly valuable. I really want to join the mindfulness happy hour. So maybe you'll see me there. And now I'll give it back to Andrea. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate it. So I would say this past year has been really a challenge for all of us. Um, but I hope this event has shown you all how much your community supports you, how much we love you, and that your worries and fears and your successes and your joys should be shared. Um, and, and we are here for you. We want you to know that. Um, this is going to be recorded. It will be on the Caregiver Recognition Day on seniorconcerns.org under events, Caregiver Recognition Day. Um, give us a couple of days to get that out there. Uh, number two, I saw in the chat, somebody was asking when our adult day program is being uh, opened back up again, and that will be September 1st. There will be some changes to the program. Um, so your best bet is to call Martha Shapiro uh, at 805-497-0189 at the Senior Concerns main number, and she can walk you through those changes. Um, but I'm just gonna end today by saying, 
I want to thank you caregivers for carving time out of your day and for spending a little time with yourselves. You all inspire me so much by doing what you do. And um, we, we all love you here at Senior Concerns. We hope that there was a little bit of a tidbit that you got out of today. But please know we are here for you, however we can help. And if you haven't picked up your goodie bag and you'd like to, give us a call. That might be with or without a COVID kit. We want to be there for you. And we really look forward to being in person next year. So and thank you, Martha, for uh, handling all of our technical AV stuff today. Really wonderful. Great job. Thanks, everybody. Have a thank wonderful you. day. Thank you.